Mike is still chatting. <laughs> Michael Kuda, Ms. Denise Kuda, and Mr. Doug Drexler. Just to count, how many people here have not been on these sets yet? Have not been on Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> you're in for a treat. That's you're in for a treat. That's and odd. just like um, in the, just like we in all the incarnations that we worked on, we didn't just go walking through the doors. There was no electronics at all. The actor would come up to the door, and somebody off stage would yell, "Door!" And you'd walk through the door. So come on in. <laughs> That's a good groucho line. <laughs> so we're going to go into, first of all, we're going to go into the transporter room. If you're a television writer like Gene Roddenberry, the man who created Star Trek, if you walk into a network executive's office and say, I'm going to do a television show about a huge starship that lands on a planet every week, they're going to look at you and go, there's no possible way you can afford that. There's no possible way, to, there's enough time to shoot those special effects. But if you're a genius like Gene Roddenberry, you say, no, no, no. We will, uh, we will invent something called a transporter. So people will step into this magic room and zap, you're on the planet in, in five seconds. Of course, the other thing, I mean, if you've read uh, Gene Roddenberry's writer guide for the original series, he describes the style of the show as being very fast, oh. uh, that it was cut very quick. And if you think back to the show, the way it was, you'd be on the bridge, Kirk would say, McCoy, Spock, you're with me. The camera would cut to the transporter console blinking, pan up just as they were coming through, step onto the platform, Kirk would say, energize, and they're in the thick of the action. So as a storytelling device, it was brilliant. One of the things that really amazed us, um, because we did recreate some of the sets, a lot of the sets, for different incarnations of Star Trek, but we never did create, recreate the transporter room, sick bay, and engineering. And so it, those were new to us. And for me, when I walked into this room, the space seemed a lot smaller than when I saw it on TV. But as you'll notice, as you go through and you take your photos, when you look through the viewfinder, the lens expands the, the set. And that's very much what they do. They used lenses to make the, the sets look bigger and, and have more depth. Um, these are called Fresnel lenses. Their covers on uh, lights are kind of heavy. And what was really interesting is that where Fresnel lights were in the top of the transporters from, I think, the, the motion picture. Yeah, the exact same lenses were repurposed and, and put into the ceilings. And yeah. apparently, not many people except us um, knew that they were there because I don't think they'd last very long. They probably would have disappeared. Yeah. They lasted from Star Trek the motion picture, Star Trek 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, Star Trek Next Generation, all through the end of Star Trek Voyager. Uh, those the same lenses from the original transporter room were there. Absolutely. And when those sets were struck and we were there, um, it was very interesting. I don't know if you've ever heard of a, of a television series, proposed television series called Star Trek Phase Two. That okay, you all know. You, you guys are a knowledgeable audience. And in engineering, when we, they were taking all of the Voyager uh, sets down, behind that was the um, the skeleton of engineering for Phase Two. I. I was down there, I don't know if Dougie and I were down there, and Mike was up in the art department, but we saw that and we said, got on the phone and we said, oh my God, get yourself down here right now and take a look at the history that we found. We felt, felt like archaeologists. <laughs> <laughs> this, this set, as many sets in Star Trek, changed uh, quite a bit. In the earlier episodes, we have the, the stomach over here. They did remove that. Uh, we have the, the uh, viewer back there that was used for um, assignment. Or One of the things that uh, is notable is that ground zero for the Star Trek design aesthetic comes from the 1964-1965 New York World's Fair, which was in Flushing Meadows. And these gooseneck viewers are actually smaller sized versions of a video phone that Bell Telephone introduced in the Bell Telephone Pavilion. And I, of course, I spent a lot of time at the New York World's Fair. My father had a TV repair store about two blocks away, so he used to drop me off twice a week for two summers. I was like 11 years old, and he picked me up at night. And I think back on that, and I think, wow, I can't believe, that's so amazing that he let me do that. And then I think about it, and I go, well, maybe he's trying to get rid of me. <laughs> Because who leaves a kid, you know, in 11? But, but uh, yeah, so that's, there's, there's and, and, and Google 1964-65 New York World's Fair, you'll see the New York State Pavilion is Starbase 11, and, you know, it, it really is uh, remarkable. This is my oh, favorite place in the entire set, because you can look this way, and if there's another tour, you can, all you see is corridor. 
Makes you feel like you're there. Yeah. You go to sick bay? Sure. Okay. We'll come this way to sick bay. Anyway, you're in sick bay. This is sick bay ward, and it changed a little bit uh, too. If you might remember, there was a third bed that was right over here for numerous episodes: Journey to Babel, Dolly and Webb, um, Return to Tomorrow. They have they had the third bed here. But again, these are to me the most iconic graphic in all of the original series is the life sign monitor above the beds. I mean, it tells the story. You can be a doctor or a nurse across the hall, and you can look up and just see how your patient's doing, what their condition is. And this is 1964, 65, 66. And then you flash forward what we have today is that we have many instruments that are next to patients that you could walk in the room and you could do the same thing. They were way ahead of their time. And when I was a little girl, this is where I wanted to be because I did grow up to be a registered nurse, and this is where I wanted to be on the enterprise. And I always thought this was just so brilliant and so, and, and so perfect. Well, you know, you don't have to have anybody tell you what it is. Yeah, it's You just need great. to glance at it. Yeah. And it's, once again, everything about Trek is so clear and direct. Even if you know nothing about medicine, when those little arrows go down, <laughs> and we're in trouble here. Yeah. Now, SickBay uh, ended up being the most expansive set on the show. I believe that SickBay originated as just this room from where no man has gone yes. before, where we get Gary Mitchell here. But it was interesting because uh, the SickBay grew as it went along, and it became an example of really creative repurposing of stuff that was used and built for other shows, which is a great money-making, a money-saving uh, thing. The other interesting thing, and we'll talk about it more later, and we'll look at a diagram, was that this arc of the of the way sick bay runs, these walls were not originally here on the show. They were open. And Star Trek grew out of, um, it was the Desi Lu situation comedy, I Love Lucy, culture, it was, a, it was a way of shooting that was pioneered by Lucy and Desi. And that was, and it's still used to this very day, where you had, it was like a railroad flat of sets, one next to each other. For one, you could have an audience watch the entire show, didn't matter what set you were in. But the other thing was that it was all about speed, and that you would have all your equipment out here, and all of these sets were open. So. Bob Justman could plan a day where they could start shooting in here and through the day, all they had to do was when they got done in here, they would just move all the equipment down to the next set and then shoot in Dr. in the examination room next door. So it was a, that was that was a, all about saving money. Uh, all the designs were about getting people off the clock because they didn't shoot much later than seven o'clock. They, they only shot, they, they shot what, six shot days a week. Eight hour, they shot eight hour days. It's very easy to say that the studios were cheap they were, uh, and that they were, they were um, uh, against creativity. But the other way to look at it is you have a certain amount of, uh, of money as a, as, a, uh, as, a, as a director, as a, as a production designer. You have a certain amount of money. So if you are efficient in how you use that money, if you're efficient in how you use your time, you, for that given amount of money, you can put more, more things on the screen. You can get more angles. You can shoot more coverage. You can do more creativity. You can spend more time in the lighting. If you are efficient, if you waste, if you waste your time with things that aren't going to show up on camera, then you're hurting the look of the show. And uh, Matt Jeffries, Bob Justin, those people, they were simply geniuses. Cool. Anyway, we're in the exam. This is another just brilliant, brilliant ahead of its time. We talked about the graphic. Um, we talk, one thing that I always like to say is that, you know, just like in history where, where we human beings, you know, 200, 300 years, we're all the same. We're the same. And there are certain things, even though you're going to have technology, you're going to have different ways of delivering things, there's something you might have to deliver intravenous fluids. And we saw this get up like in, in Journey to Babel, which I thought was brilliant. It was simple. It was crossing the line between... 20th century technology and 23rd century technology. And through all the series, we did it in Enterprise, and I thought we got it, eh, it was okay. But they just never did it right. But the original series, as usual, got it right. And this exam table, it, this one works. Um, I, t I was told that nobody's allowed to lay on it, but James let me yesterday. It was a childhood dream of mine, so I got to lay on it and go like this. It was really fun. Um, 
But again, you've got to be careful. You get the catapult. It, it really <laughs> is. Right. It, it, it's very disconcerting. That you're, just, <laughs> you're just like this. Again, Michael talked about and Doug talked about these walls that weren't here and they could move. The the, aid, the the assistant directors, when they were working out and, and doing the flow of work for the day, they would start maybe in one over in the sick bay ward and they would move this way. That way, you don't have to waste time with the company changing location set, setups and so forth. Then it just saved time and which equals money. Now, you talked about how sick bay grew as time went on. That set over there was built for no man has gone before. This section was built for the first production episode, the Corbo Mine Maneuver, where you know McCoy is giving, uh, putting Kurt through. His, You're killing me! You're killing me! And he's uh, like working that thing in the wall. So th this came next. I don't think they had this table yet. No, they, no, they no, didn't. It's a simpler table. Yeah. yeah. But they had it for a uh, make of time. In fact, we have a photo right there for a reference. Not that you guys need reference. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's why it's so nice talking to you guys. You know what we're talking about. Um, Here's another example of the incredible juxtaposition of, of, of no, angles no. and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's, and it's just so Matt Jeffries. You know Matt Jeffries had his hands in all of this stuff. And simplicity in design is, we think, is always best. Yeah, it's direct. And, you know, the thing that makes Matt's stuff so good is you can hire some of the best illustrators that, you, you know, you got, bring in some illustrators who are known for doing incredible illustrations. And they might not necessarily do the best job for the show because someone like that can make a crummy design look terrific because of their technique. Matt's designs were very simple. If you look at the Star Trek sketchbook, he did not labor over any of them. They were all very simplistic, almost like folk art. So that in order to be good, they had to really be good. You know, you couldn't take a mediocre idea and make it look gorgeous because you're just an incredible illustrator, you know. Yeah, I, you, I think you'd almost rather have someone who isn't such a good illustrator. Have someone who isn't quite so good because the designs could will probably be stronger. And I think that Matt is a good example of that. Matt wanted to convey futuristic, uh, futuristic quality with everything he did. But he was also up against time. He was also up against money. So, if, for example, one of, the, one of the other icons of the future is the television series The Jetsons. And everything is sleek. Everything is curved. Every, uh, every everything is uh, seems to defy gravity in a way that uh, that Matt clearly wanted to go toward. However, building those kind of curves, building th those kinds of things, uh, suddenly becomes tremendously expensive. So Matt came up with uh, his style is a compromise. He, he frequently has these interesting tapers to uh, that that make things more exciting, that make things more, more interesting, and just takes, takes away from the boxy ordinariness of, 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 of many things. And, and by doing that, he takes a very conventional thing, bed, and gives it an unexpected quality. He does these things in a way that suggests in some way that it's functional. And in doing so, that little bit of extra flair, that little bit of apparent function, helps convey in everything that he does everything that he did, a sense that we are in an era of more advanced technology. You look at the base, at, at the tapered uh, lines on this base, and you compare it to the, to the tapered lines of the, of the bases in the, uh, in the, uh, in the wardroom, and, you, and you, you see that Matt's designs carry through, uh, through a consistent style throughout basically everything, everything he did. Yeah. You look, even, even this angled hood, angle on, on the uh, on the arm. He made everything very difficult to rebuild. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> he made everything difficult to rebuild. Are you kidding? This is, he made everything easy to rebuild. Compound angles everywhere. This is easy. <laughs> <laughs> Try building the Enterprise D bridge. Yeah. Yeah. Try that. They're, they're, they're relatively yeah. difficult to build compared to ordinary ca uh, cabin work, absolutely. But compared to, uh, say, the compound curves you have on the, on the bridge of the Enterprise D, right. uh, these were humane, trust me. <laughs> there, was, uh, there, there was this amazing curved console in the Enterprise D bridge where a, a guy worked for literally weeks building it up 16 dimension time uh, at a time uh, laminating. There was a lot of round, round it. Yeah, yeah. which spells it's money. Beautiful. That means money. But it's something, it's something that Matt never had the luxury to, to do. You know, um, when we were talking about repurposing stuff, and really McCoy's lab is next door is the real example of stuff being creatively repurposed. Uh, if you look over here, and this is still being built, 
Um, this, which makes perfect sense, I'm sure Matt realized it when he built it for uh, court martial, Kirk's apartment on Starbase 11, where I believe it was Starbase 11. It was uh, Starbase 11. Uh, there was a couch in his apartment when he meets Samuel T. Cogley, attorney at law. This came, you know, ended up in here. It's the perfect place for it. Um, but really, the, the great example is next door. We're going to go there in a minute. One of the things I loved and that Matt did often was try to do designs that defied gravity, which suggested, uh, you know, architecture technology that was ahead of its time. Uh, techno I mean, for instance, if you look at the Enterprise itself, and you see those massive nacelles going way back with the spindly little struts up near the front, you, you look at that. I've had many people say to me, that's so absurd. They, those, those struts could never support those engines, and it doesn't make any sense. And for me, I saw it a totally different way. I mean, in a way that I, I think is not cynical. I thought the other people were being cynical. I looked at it and I said, wow, these guys know stuff we don't. There's technology at work here that's way beyond us. Uh, this, this table is kind of an example of that with this, with this uh, you know, uh, the way the legs work on it. Uh, it gives the impression of being floating in the same way that the nacelles do on the ship. Um, I think it's, a, it, it, and it's something that I thought uh, transferred beautifully over to Next Generation when they did it. Um, you know, the, the uh, con and ops stations are very floaty and defy gravity. That beautiful rail that wraps around behind Picard, it defies gravity. Uh, the transporter console on the Enterprise D, has almost the same kind of setup here with this leg that jogs back and just gives the feeling that it, it it's defying gravity. And I thought that some of the shows, like Voyager, I thought lost that idea. If you look at the Voyager bridge, all of the consoles are very heavy, straight to the ground, like like filing cabinets, or I, you know, or you serve ice cream out of. You know, it, I, I thought that was a, a big mistake. I'm, look, I, they did. A, there was a lot of beautiful work on Voyager, don't get me wrong. But for me, they lost that, that futuristic defy gravity look, which I think has always been a mainstay of Star Trek and that Matt used to great advantage. One of the things that we we're amazed with when we were walking through here for the first time with James is he was talking about how, you know, I mean, there really aren't blueprints. There weren't many blueprints to be had. And most of this is the folks building these uh, these sets and the detailing of these sets, watching the episodes, doing frame grabs, and 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 figuring it out. And behind you, that grating right there, they couldn't find that. They couldn't find what, so that's PVC <laughs> piping that they cut, and there's like 4,000 something uh, pieces and glued together. Astonishing. That's why another thing that we just love so much, obviously we're very passionate about Star Trek. You all are passionate about Star Trek. Folks that build these sets are really passionate about Star Trek. One of the challenges when you're doing something mean, that's futuristic is uh, one of the things that you tend to do is you tend to make things look more complicated as you get into the future. Uh, the problem is complicated tends to be expensive. So you have a very low budget show, you have a situation where doing something complicated was, was, uh, was not only difficult, it was not only expensive, and therefore it's something that that uh, the show really couldn't do. So uh, Matt Jeffries, in his considerable genius, said, okay, we're gonna go in the exact opposite direction. We're gonna show that something is so sophisticated that it's, that it's simplistic. The, uh, the microchip, microchip props, just chunks of, chunks of masonite or uh, whatever, whatever they were, uh, they, they were obviously forerunners of what, what became cassette tapes, of what became uh, floppy disks, of what, become, uh, what became uh, uh, flash drives. But look, look how, how simple th these are. They, they, could have, they could have made them complicated. They, they could have put blinking lights on them, but th they couldn't afford to. And instead of saying, oh my god, we couldn't afford to put blinking lights on them, they said, this doesn't need a blinking light. This doesn't right. need, this doesn't Just need the suggestion control. Control. Right. Yeah. This, we are so sophisticated, we're, we're simple. On the other hand, at the same time, they understood that they were going to need computers. They understood computers were going to be an important part of the future, that flying a star was, was going to require it. But remember, this is 1964 when they first designed the ship, and no one really knew what a computer was going to look like. No one really knew what it, um, uh, how you were going to interface with a computer. 
So a large chunk of the, uh, and, and of course they, they really couldn't afford to, to build anything hugely complicated. The only thing that they really knew is that computers had blinking lights. So they designed these computer terminals that they could put basically anywhere. And they suggested a, uh, a computer. They, they used them and they obviously worked on the show. But it's very interesting in that it was designed well before anyone knew that you, you'd use keyboards, certainly before there were, there were, um, there were uh, 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 video screens or, or touch screens. And yet the, the fact that they put them everywhere showed that they knew automation, that, uh, that digital systems, intelligent network systems were going to be an important part of the future. Yeah, shall we head over to the next set, which is the laboratory? But look at how beautifully these things go together. Well, of course, the style, which is Matt's style, they're inherently they're, they're going to go together perfectly. But you know, when they were doing this stuff and Matt was putting stuff into storage, or if they didn't have room for storage, they would have to destroy it or get rid of it. But in his mind, he was cataloging everything and said, you know, these two things work great together. Although, one of my favorite uh, repurposing uh, items was this. It wasn't repurposed from Star Trek. It comes from uh, a favorite show of mine when I was a kid called My Favorite Martian, which Ray Walston, as Uncle Martin, this is one of his pieces of Martian lab equipment. And when I saw it, I flipped out, I mean, because I am a fan, and these guys will tell you, I have a full-size Uncle Martin spaceship in my garage. <laughs> which is, if you know about the show, I, the garage is like a, a perfect diorama for it, because that's where it was hidden in Bill Bixby's right, garage. Right, right. And I said, James, did, my God, you have this made? And he says, no, I'll tell you. The story about this is that when Comedy Central did the William Shatner roast, and they had Clint Howard on as Baylock, <laughs> Tranya, I hope you roasted as much as I, this is, it was made for that. And of course, James always has his ear to the ground. And when things turn up, he's there to get them. So that's why it's here. It was used on the show, which makes sense, because my favorite Martian was shot at Desi Lu. It was actually on the same stages that Star Trek was on before Star Trek moved in. And because Matt worked on a number of Desi Lu shows, he worked on Ben Casey, he worked on The Untouchables, uh, what was the other one that you mentioned? Pilot, Pilot, for Mission Mission Impossible. Pilot for Mission Impossible. So he knew everything that was going on, he knew stuff that was in storage, and so he was there to grab it and use it on the show and save a buck and it looked cool. Mm -hmm. oh, this blueprint is from uh, James Colley's personal collection. It shows the layout of the actual stage, not, uh, stage 9 and Paramount Pictures, showing all of these permanent sets which are, which are replicated here. One of the things that I find most fascinating is we're, we're standing in the laboratory uh, we, here, and as we indicated before, all of these walls along this side of the sets uh, were actually open uh, throughout most of production. And you can see this blueprint shows you how easy it was for the camera crew to move from one set to another set to another to, the, to another to facilitate production. Beautiful Back when Mike and Doug and I were working uh, on Trek, we had this blueprint as well, and we were going to do trials and tribulations. And on the Desi Lu set, um, they, they had their standing sets on stage 9, and their planet set was on stage 10. And it changed to 30 and 31 when, when everything 31, 32. 31, 32 when everything became paramount. So we took this blueprint, and we went in. The stage was completely empty, which and was just the three of us, which is even cooler. And we walked in there with this blueprint, and we walked out where the sets were going to be. And that's when we first realized how small the space was. And it's echoed in a lot of these sets that you walk in and you go, oh my God, it's not that big. On this side here, it's work in progress. It's going to be the, uh, the decompression chamber. Um, you can see a reference photo right there from the lights of Zatar. Of course, it was also used um, in Spacey. Any questions? Yes, sir. What that thing? Oh. <laughs> this, the blinky uh, light. Yes. <laughs> This is another repurposed prop. Uh, we saw it as, Dr. as the nanopulse laser in the episode iMud. And of course, there's, there's a cool gizmonometer, so they <laughs> put it here. And uh, yes. I'm sure it's an important part of medical research. Yes, <laughs> it's not a repurposed You cannot cure. Like yes, <laughs> like well, you know, the 3D chess set, and, and that is a work of art. That is a beautiful sculpture. I mean, it's, it's, it's iconic of Star Trek. And most people, even if they don't know about Star Trek, know what it is but the, it, it's just a perfect example of taking something and spinning it a turn of the screw into the future something that's familiar but you're seeing it in a new unfamiliar way and it, 
it's it's just a masterpiece of design. Did Matt design that? Do you know? I suspect he did. I suspect he did. I yeah, it really is beautiful. This is Captain Kirk's quarters. They only had one quarter quarters set, and so it was redressed or repurposed or reused for Spock's quarters or um, Uhura's quarters or Marlena Moreau for, um, from uh, Mirror Mirror or um, MacGyver's from Spacey. Yeah. And you also notice, notice this in the corner. Um, this was used as the uh, ventilation system in the, um, in the episode Obsession. Garavik was here and he took the, the lid off the food that uh, Chapel brought in, you know, one word, eat. Um, he threw it against there, opened the vent, and the creature came inside. And of course, the science officer, to stop the alien coming in, goes like this. <laughs> but, yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't think that was very important. No, I don't. <laughs> the intent, it was a good, 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 good intention. So good intentions. most of the items that you see in here are recreations, but there is one item that is the real deal. This was used in the original series in Captain Kirk's quarters, and the story that James tells us, the story is this. Uh, when the series was done and wrapped, uh, William Shatner had this chest, and he gave it to one of the presidents of a fan club in Canada. And when that person passed, uh, it was passed down to her daughter, and she wasn't a Star Trek fan and didn't know the significance and decided to auction it. And James Colley, who is always on the look for things, <laughs> purchased it, and now it is here, an original uh, prop for us to all enjoy. Yeah, it's amazing. You know, another great example of Matt using basically an optical illusion to convince you that there's a ceiling uh, in this set is this beam that runs across, that's painted in off-white, that runs across here. That, that next time you watch the show, take a look in Kirk's quarters. If the camera is catching this darker area above, because it is darker and because we do have this demarcation, it makes you, that appears to be the ceiling. That is brilliant. And of course, they, they really, it was easy, it was better for them to leave the ceilings. You know, on, on TNG, a lot of times we would pull a, a white muslin over the top and shine lights through that. But, you know, this is really much more uh, efficient and effective for them to have left it open. You want to rotate? I'm one sorry, little, go honey. One little piece of the set that is dis decidedly not accurate, but is nevertheless my favorite bit, is behind Denise is a little black book with, uh, with alien writing on it. Fans, uh, fans of the old Twilight Zone series will recognize that as a, as a cookbook. <laughs> it's a cookbook. If you want to rotate and go into the sleeping quarters, you'll see uh, uh, the mirror over here in the alcove that was used in um, the enemy within for the evil Kirk to cover up the scratch that James Lester gave him, or in Uhura's quarters for, from the Tholian web. You know, the thing about quarters is that you can use it to tell a story about a character, give you insight into who they are. And Almost everybody else's quarters, if you look at Spock's quarters, it's very, very decked out with drapery and sculptures and, you know, uh, it tells you who he is and where he's from. If you look at uh, uh, MacGyver quarters in Spacey, there were paintings and sculptures. If you go in um, Uhura's quarters, there was an African motif. But when you come into Kirk's quarters, it's really pretty Spartan. There's very little in here to tell you about who he was. And I don't know that this was the reason behind it, but in my head, I always felt, this guy is your commanding officer. And if you come in here to have a meeting with him, he's not there to be your pal. He's your commanding officer. He doesn't want you to know too much about him. It's all about the ship and about duty. And, I, and for me, that really worked very well. Um, whether that was the original intent, I don't know, but that's the way it came across to me, and uh, it served the show. Special story about this. Well, I mean, we always loved this little alcove because it was something I wish we had on more other ships. Is a, a ladder where you could have somebody either going up and disappearing or coming down, and it told you that this was a ship and that there were various decks. But Mike's got a great story about this sign here. Yeah, if you look inside of here, there's a little warning sign that says, environmental, pers environmental engineering personnel only. Well, back in the 60s, the way you made a sign is there were these very talented artists called sign writers. They would hand letter these things and they looked look absolutely beautiful. The problem was that the sign writer who originally did that sign uh, was not necessarily the best speller in the world. So he or she misspelled the word environmental. Uh, it was spelled environmental, which you can kind of understand. They left the end. 
Well, one of the ends, yes. So, uh, in the crush of production, Matt didn't notice it. It went on the stage. They shot the first day in the, in the set. And uh, then Matt discovered it. He went, oh my God, it's on film. <laughs> so the worst thing you want is, uh, you, want your you don't want your boss to discover this. So he went to, uh, to, Matt, or to Gene Roddenberry and said, Gene, I misspelled this, I apologize, uh, we'll, we'll get it fixed. And Gene, who, uh, who very legitimately couldn't, could have gotten mad, just said, with a good humor, he said, no problem, Matt, tomorrow I'm going to issue a memo that says, in the future, the spelling of the word environmental is going to be changed. <laughs> <laughs> I love this set. Uh, again, very relatively simple curves. This is actually one of the most expensive curves in, uh, on, on these parts of the sets. But the ingenious use of, this, of the curve, the angled, angled walls suggest that we're on the, on the exterior rim of the ship and really brings, as Doug says, a, a nautical flair to it, while maintaining the open ceilings that are so important to making it efficient for the, uh, for the, for the lighting crew. Yes. And this table, for instance, the, you, you know, if, it, if, you would do, if it was like Perry Mason or a law show or something where they were going to have a meeting in a conference room, the table would be a simple rectangle, which isn't very interesting to shoot. But Matt was always looking for interesting shapes and he really knocked it out of the ballpark with this one. I mean, they must have had a terrific time lining up interesting shots of people who shared a meeting. Especially shots of people facing each other. Yeah. Not to mention this incredible foreshadowing of the desktop computer. In 1966, designed earlier than that, that that's like, I mean, that is science fiction like you can't even believe. Back then, a computer would be several rooms in size. Oh, this is like what we've got now. Or video conferencing. Or video conferencing. Uh, it's video it's video. Yeah. so ahead of its time. It's yeah. just scary, they really, actually. They did their homework. Yeah. You know. um, these chess pieces were in uh, some of the episodes. I think it was in Charlie X's way deep background, so you can't really see it. But then they created this, which is the 3D unplanned thing, yeah. 3D chess sets. These were commercially available toys in the 60s, um, and they repurposed them to make this, which is all. Oh, my God, it's such an elegant work of art. One, one of the world. things that, that Gene Roddenberry always tried to do is everything that he wrote into the show. He tried to try to find some futuristic, interesting, yet affordable angle to, to show that it's not just chess, but it's chess in the future. So chess in the future is obviously going to be three-dimensional. And, and the, uh, the prop makers, I didn't know this until today, or until yesterday, that they repurposed pieces of these two commercial uh, uh, toys to make, to make this. And that's such an iconic piece of, uh, of Star Trek design. You know, when we did Trials and Tribulations, we had to draw diagrams and the mill made them because you couldn't get, you couldn't find them. Of course, you James was able to find them. You couldn't, but uh, we, could, we couldn't find it in, in a week and a half. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, that's about all the time we had to plan it and build it and, you know. And I remember the, the viewer on the middle of the table, when it wasn't when it wasn't on, wasn't it active, it looked like that, right? Nothing on it. There's nothing to display. And the director of photography is just like, no, it should have something on it. We're going, no, but you don't understand. We didn't say you don't understand. But we said, <laughs> it's supposed to be like that. And he, no, he just went. So we went upstairs and got some graphics and put them in there. But that's the compromise. We've spoken many times of the genius of Matt Jeffries, but of course, each person on the crew has his or her uh, uh, specialty. And uh, Jim Rugg, who was the, uh, uh, the show's mechanical effects person, told me that what Matt wanted for, the, uh, for these uh, intercoms is he actually wanted to take an, uh, an acrylic tube or an acrylic cylinder rod, angle it, cut it, so that you can have an elliptical shaped light here. And uh, 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 Mr. Rugg said, well, that actually would have been very, very, very difficult. To do. It would have been easy to cut the rod, very difficult to make the hole. So the compromise was they made it this, this oval shape, and that's what, that's what ended up in the show, and that just shows that each person has to, you have to take the other departments into consideration. Where did you meet Jim Rugg? I mean, he wasn't on the Lakers show, was No. Yeah. Uh, uh, I used to be part of the director, uh, 
bankrupt in, in Honolulu. Mm -hmm. And at that time, Mr. Rudd was on Hawaii 5 0. So, <laughs> so I, I, I called him. He said, You need to over. That's great. Yeah, we've never met. We didn't meet no, Jimmy Rudd. No. Yeah, you know, uh, when we did Trials and Tribulations, uh, there's a scene, it's the scene from Tribbles where Kirk is walking back and forth, he's got them all lined up, and he wants to know who, who was, who started, who, who, started, who, started, who started, you know, who started the fight. And um, so they're all lined up, and Gary Hustle was a visual effects supervisor who was a genius, and we beloved Gary, and we loved him. And um, uh, he had to take that scene of those guys wrote a, a couple of guys out of it and put Bashir and O'Brien in the lineup. And the next time you watch it, <laughs> Gary says, the next time, Gary says that if you look at it closely, you'll see that there's one extra set of feet in the line. <laughs> but who is going to notice? Anyway, he had to roto out all these guys so there was nothing to put behind them. And Gary came into the art department. Uh, and actually, you knew Gary was coming to ask you to do something for him at the last minute because he'd come in like this and he'd go. <laughs> like, you knew it was time to run. But no, we were always there for Gary and we, and we loved him. But he wanted us to make this corner of the briefing room in miniature. And we had... Gar Gary came in and he was, a little, he was actually a little apologetic. He said, uh, we, I, I need a model of this part of, of one of the original series sets. And he was, he was expecting pushback from the art department. <laughs> and Doug jumped up and said, I'll do it. <laughs> me, 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 oh, me, me. <laughs> but uh, so, you know, I mean, of course, today we could do it in a computer in an hour, you know. But uh, it wouldn't have been half as much fun as drawing up all these templates and making the pieces and putting it all together and then Gary sticks it behind them. That was one of the fun things about working on Trek is that we all worked together and we all had the passion for it. And so, yeah, we were going to work. Yeah, it was long hours and so forth and so on. We just had a good time and we had a great time being together. And we formed lifelong friendships, we and others. And it's all just because of Gene Roddenberry's Star Trek, which is amazing. Yeah, sure. Is. Whenever Scotty needed to pick something on the internal guts of the ship, somehow the, the, that wiring always passed through here. We, we always thought, I always thought that this somehow Led up to the, uh, to the, uh, to the war for myself, but it was never specifically said. It was never actually called. That's, that's very it was never actually like. called a uh, Jeffers Tube on the original Star Trek. That was just an, that was an internal, internal term that the staff used. But we used it so much in Star Trek: The Next Generation that eventually it worked its way into dialogue. So there are, in fact, Jeffers Tubes in this in the real Star Trek universe. You know, I, I remember. Uh, I love, I love the Jeffries tube so much. It's so much fun, and it's very dynamic. I mean, you could run up the tube and come swinging out like Tarzan on a vine, which Jimmy <laughs> Dillon used to do all the time. But you know, the thing that uh, that always struck me was that uh, you know, uh, Matt was a flight engineer on a B-17 and flew missions against Rommel over Africa, and and Gene Roddenberry was a B-17 pilot and flew in the Pacific. So. When Jimmy comes swinging out feet first, it's very much like the forward hatch on a B-17. If you ever watch 12 o'clock high, that's the way you egress that hatch. You come out feet first, you swing out. And I, I tell you though, it's not, and Jimmy was really, I mean, he made it look like he lived and worked on this ship. You know, there was nothing, um, th there was no caution or anything about the way he did it. It just looked so natural for him to do it. And, Earlier today, I tried to do it, and I almost hurt myself. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's surprisingly difficult to climb up. It and is. It's, uh, and it's got a lot of sharp angles. Yeah, if you don't have shoes on, and they tell us we had to take our shoes well, off, yeah. these things freaking hurt. They don't usually let people do that, but yesterday they let me, I took my shoes off. And just trying to get up this to get back into it, you really have to use your quadricep muscles, and it's hard. So I just, this blew my mind. How did Jimmy do and come swinging out? He made it look so easy. He was in shape. He was in shape. The engine room was the last major standing set made for, uh, made for the Enterprise on the original series. Uh, when this was built, a lot of the other sets were, had already been uh, vacated. So Matt Jeffries had to wedge this set into really this very constrained space. And yet, he, uh, yet Gene Roddenberry specifically asked him, he wanted this set to convey 
this huge size, the enormous power of the enterprise. How do you do that in a space that's maybe 30-ish 30, 30 feet long? If you're Matt Jeffries, you, you use a production design technique called forced perspective. Each succeeding uh, row of, of, of tubes is smaller and smaller. So if you look at it with one eye, you get the illusion that there's this huge cathedral-like space that, that contains the power that it takes to, uh, to drive a starship. The, uh, the set itself evolved quite a bit over, over the series. Uh, uh, this gizmo came and went. This, uh, this ladder up here at some point. And for one episode only, there were these, these, these lovely con-killing wrenches you could pull out. Think about the big fight in Space Sea. And think about those, those gymnastics that the, uh, the stunt people did in this really tiny space. It's amazing. It, it looked just like the size of a gymnasium. That first time when we knew we were going to be trials and tribulations, and like Nancy was saying, we went down to stage with the blueprint. We were like astonished at how small this was. But yes. This is like an example of the production designer and the director of photography working together to make this thing seem immense. And you know, you may have seen pictures like, for instance, a bunch of airliners stacked up on the tarmac, and they all look like they're crushed together, you know, one right behind the other. And the, you get that, what, the way they would get a shot like that is you would use a lens that's like maybe a 150 millimeter lens, a 200 millimeter lens, and lenses like that pull t reduce the distance between things. To shoot something like this, now I don't know what lens they used in here. If our friend Gary Hutzel, who's a visual effects supervisor on all the shows we worked on, who was amazing, who could look at a picture and say, uh, yeah, that's an 18, which is, it blows my mind. I, they may, it may have been a lens like an 18. Of course, you have to be real careful shooting with a lens like that because it tends to distort things. But it just made this place look immense. In the original series, we didn't have all these cool blinkies. We had somebody standing behind just with a, a slider that would make the buttons change color. And you can you can notice that in, in the series, but here it's been it's been teched up a little bit. They replaced money with clever. Yes. yes. These always I, I used to think as a kid, what are these silicon nodules doing in here? <laughs> Dilithium crystal was obviously an uh, enterprise incident. Yeah. Yeah. And this forced perspective is amazing. We're going to be taking you to the next set, but I want you to go around the corner. When we go around the corner, take a look and see how small that is. Isn't this amazing? Welcome, I know. It's welcome amazing. to the Enterprise Bridge. The Enterprise Bridge was the first set that was designed by Matt Jeffries on the very first episode of Star Trek. In fact, uh, Jeffries' only tasks on, on that first episode were, uh, were the Enterprise itself uh, and, and, the, and this bridge. Jeffries did an absolutely brilliant job. Here we are 50 years later. This absolutely still holds up. You believe it's a command center. You believe you can, you can operate a starship and its many departments from this uh, from this very place. Uh, the Department of Defense, NASA, a lot of corporations have studied this uh, studied this very room, this very set, and used it as an inspiration for uh, for places that control the uh, uh, the space shuttle, places that control. Uh, an experimental uh, uh, command center for the Department of Defense, a communication center for, uh, for the United States Navy, all were inspired by the bridge of the Enterprise. Yeah, it's, you know, it's because that design is so direct and logical, and as Mike pointed out, aircraft logic. When, that, was, that was Matt's favorite term. I, I mean, and it, it, it shows here more than anywhere else. And when you look at it, and, and you see this captain's chair in the center, He's got communications directly behind his head. So his ear and Uhura is funneling information in. And he can swivel his chair 360 degrees. And all of these readouts are at his eye level. He can see everything that everyone is doing all of the time. And because it's so logical and so believable, and often when people do science fiction, they say, well, you know, it's science fiction. It doesn't really matter. Nobody really knows. Matt Jeffries never treated this as if it was science fiction. He treated it as if it was real. And you can see the effect that it had on people. How many, especially when we were on the show, all the people who came to visit, scientists, astronauts, physicists, we were there on the Enterprise D bridge when Stephen Hawking came in because he had to see the bridge of the Enterprise and asked to be lifted out of his chair and put into Picard's chair. Oh my God. <laughs> When, when Hawking uh, went to the engine room, 
uh, he, he didn't literally point, but he figuratively pointed at, at the at the warp car and he said, "I'm working on that." <laughs> <laughs> well, the funny thing was that everyone laughed, and then the laughter just kind of yeah, he's really because you knew he wasn't he's kidding. The one person who can do it. <laughs> yes. He's not kidding. You know, we talked about. I think we talked about some of the the, the ships, uh, like the B and 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 the E. Um, being on, um, uh, on shakers or, or gimbals where the set would actually uh, tilt and so forth. This set uh, did not, thank God. But what they would do, and you'll see this as an example, we all worked on a, on a, a project, a, a Blu-ray project for CBS called the Roddenberry Vault, which was this uh, cool footage that had, hadn't been seen in decades and decades and some never seen. And what the director, and we have a little bit of that on, on the Roddenberry Vault, the director would instruct the actors to tilt left or right, and it would look like you know the ship was listing and so forth and so on. That was all just acting, no physical, no physical action. And yet it was amazingly compelling. It's, it's shockingly hard to tell the difference between doing this and actually moving the set. Does it yeah. work any better? It doesn't work any better. Because we actually had a bridge that was put on uh, hydraulics for one of the features where you get a crazy feature director who's used to anything, getting anything he wants. And Mike and I were standing on the bridge checking out a gra graphics that had been put in, and without any warning, the entire bridge lurched to one side. And you know, like, we live in the earthquake zone, you know? And <laughs> we didn't know what was going on. But it is so visceral and so jarring to, I mean, because, as you were pointing out about when, when you work in film, you think of a Starship bridge as being nailed to the floor. So when it moves, you go. <laughs> <laughs> that was startling. I will never forget that. As but the design of this bridge, I think, we think, uh, it, it is, is functional. It, you, you come in here and you believe that this is some place where people work. It's, it's not like an, an Apple store where it's just blinkies and, and flashies and so forth. We think that this place is really functional. Yes, sir. Why, why, until J.J. Abrams' universe came along, did we not ever have 20th century seat belts? We have inertial dampeners. I still see people thrown across the bridge of the Enterprise. You know what? Because yeah, when well, you don't fall out of your chair, it's not as interesting. Okay. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> that it, it is a production on one hand. On one hand. Think about the motion picture. Yeah, yeah right. You went yeah. a situation, the arm, the chair arm, yeah, yeah. you slid down and clamped over your legs. Yeah. It's not as cool as people doing somersaults. Yeah. 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 <laughs> on one hand, you want it to be realistic. On the other hand, you uh, you'll have to balance that with the desire to tell the story. And yeah, some they went overboard for falling out of their chairs. But you want the visceral drama of, of this. Yeah. And you know, J.J. Abrams, okay, he put seatbelts, but look at what he lost. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, let's not go there. Yeah, let's not go there. We will say that uh, that we, we're, we're insanely jealous of the amount of money he was able to spend. Absolutely, oh my gosh. <laughs> but you know, when you don't have money, what was it you were saying about not yeah. having money? Yeah. Uh, Nicholas Meyer used to say, art thrives in the, in the presence of limitations. Yes. And, and, uh, and Nick is a smart man. Yes. Does anybody have any other questions? Well, thank you very much. It was a pleasure taking you around you the sets so of the Enterprise. I could order this, but I'm not, because Mike Okuda and Denise Okuda are right. <laughs> About what? <laughs> you know, there really was no enormous danger potential in coming here. There was only the chance, not just a chance, but absolutely uh, to be thrilled right to your core. And I, I had been here before, and I had done some tours before, and I came back, and I gush to Mike and Denise and I said you must absolutely you cannot you must come see this you will you, your mind will be blown it's just amazing and and when we finally came here you know when we used, when we were at Paramount you know we were never supposed to have to, to take guests on the set and of course occasionally we'd sneak people on and you'd see that look in their eyes like oh my god here I am and and I know that's what the, that's what both of us had we, we walk into, the, into that set and it's like I'm home again I'm, I'm walking through these places that I've walked through so many times in my mind that I feel like I know it, even though it's, it's only on television. 
and now you walk through it and it's real. Yeah, but how many times and how many people get to live their dreams? I mean, how many times have we, again, walked down the corridors of the Enterprise, pretended that we were in sick bay or we were in the briefing room, and we knew there's no way we're ever going to be able to do that. And then we were fortunate enough to work on the different incarnations of Star Trek and we did, you know, relics, a little bit of the bridge, and then we did DS9 trials and tribulations, a little bit more, and the corridors, and we did Inner Mirror Darkly for Star Trek Enterprise, but not like this. Oh, no. I mean, this, this is lit and it's so well done. Uh, and to have, to have all the sets laid out in the actual positions that they were, uh, that they were back in the 60s, to be able to walk down the corridor and, and turn there, there's sick bay, and there's a transporter room, and there's engineering, there's the briefing room. It's, uh, it's a dream come true. It absolutely is. Well, I mean, especially for us who worked on the shows for almost two decades, and we've, wor we've walked the decks of many Federation starships, and we've been on many amazing sets, and many, many Star Trek episodes. And you'd think that we might be jaded, not a chance. Not a chance. And coming here was as problem. Even though we worked on all those amazing shows and all those amazing sets, it, it just doesn't compare to coming here and seeing the sets complete and lit and so lovingly recreated. It's a, you know, a slingshot through time. I can't speak for you guys. I can only speak for myself. I've had a blast the last two days. I mean, we've been, we've been so blessed to be able to welcome people into uh, this space, telling them when we first brought them in, we're going to divide it. We're going to divide it into walking on the, the corridors of the Enterprise, to walking on that ship that you've always imagined. But we're also going to talk about the production and the genius of, of art director um, Matt Jeffries and Gene Roddenberry and Bob Justman and all those folks that worked in the 1960s to, to bring these sets to life. But it was, it was an amazing experience to be able to watch people's faces, don't you think? Oh, I mean, yeah, they, we would yeah. open the doors and they would come in and they would just go, oh my gosh, I mean, we're here. I mean, it's like they don't, they kind of like they want to pinch themselves. Did you get that feeling? Oh. I mean, in some folks, I kind of wanted to stand next to them because I could see they were kind of shaking. Remember that one girl that came in here, she could hardly breathe? I'm like, oh honey, I know how you feel. <laughs> No, I mean, um, it, when you come in here, it's, it's such a thrill that goes right to the core of your being. But to get to take people through it who've never seen it before, you relive it every time you see them. You look at that look in their eyes and their, this, this sense of wonder, that sense of delight, that sense of coming home. And we've all felt it. And, and, to, and to be able to share that with other people, to, uh, with people who love it as much as we do, is just, just so magical. And another magical thing, it's, it's, and it's happened over and over again, these are strangers. We've never met them before, most of them we've never met. But you know, you get that feeling of family. And so what I have to say to people, um, if, if they're thinking about coming here, please do for, for multiple reasons. Number one, it's, it's a dream come true and you get to walk down the corridors of the Enterprise, but you need, get to meet friends you don't even know you had yet. We've talked about that so many times that you have this kind of shared childhood experience um, where when you meet people who are like that, you have an instant rapport right away. You feel like you've known each other for years. Everybody who's here who works on these sets and has made it happen, they're all really wonderful, great people, and we're just tickled to meet all of them. But we're all kindred spirits. I could walk up to anyone the first time that I, you know, that I came here, and we could have a conversation like we, we're old friends. We're all old friends who've never met. The people working on, uh, on these amazing sets, but also the people coming in and visiting. Each of them, are, they walk in a little, not quite sure what to expect, and then, then they step through those doors, and, and suddenly their eyes light up, and they're family. And you know, Gene Roddenberry, Gene Roddenberry's philosophy is so beautiful and so positive and so welcoming, and we live in this really crazy world right now. Turn on the TV, it's all down and, and, and just, very depressing and I found it so uplifting 
to come here, to do something positive, to be someplace positive, to be with folks that live the Gene Roddenberry philosophy of acceptance. And it doesn't matter what color your skin is or, or what country you came from, you're welcome here. And um, I found that to be uplifting as well. Absolutely. You know, I think we need Gene Roddenberry Star Trek more than ever. We need today. Gene Roddenberry Star Trek more than ever. Well, Star Trek was a product of the '60s. It was a product, was a product of a very turbulent time. The country was divided. Um, we were, there were economic strife. There was racial strife. And uh, in a way, we're in a in a very similar situation. So to ha to have the the positive message of Gene Roddenberry, the, um, the 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 vision of a better tomorrow, the notion that if we work together, if we're if, uh, if we are compassionate, if we're smart, uh, we can have a better tomorrow. And this place is a symbol of that. Absolutely, and and, and I want to also talk about um, James Cauley and the extraordinary gift he's given all of us, and the extraordinary crew that have put these sets together. There aren't blueprints. You don't, you don't know what these things look like. You've got to study hours and hours and hours of film study. And then you have to make it right. And James Colley, make sure that everybody gets it right. And so the gist of that is you walk into something that, is, that looks correct. It they looks, sweated the details. They sweated the details. And it feels right. Because you all know, we and other folks that enjoy Star Trek, they're very discerning customers. They, they, they know their stuff. You can't pull the wool over Star Trek fans' eyes. You really can't. And you come in here and it just feels like it looks right. Well, you, I mean, when you come in and, and, it, and it looks right, it smells right, it tastes, th th that, the feeling, you, you get an incredible feeling of belonging mm. when you're here and everyone wants to feel that. But, you know, so often, things uh, in life can be disappointing, but this isn't one of them. <laughs> you'll come here and you'll be absolutely amazed. I've been here for two days and I haven't stopped. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're, so we're on a mission. Our mission is to go home and to tell our friends all about this and to say you have got to come here. We're coming back, I don't know when, but we're coming back. Oh, absolutely, it's, I it's, can't wait. And, and you know, the thing is, to be here with you guys, I mean, we've been together, we're family, and. And, and we met because of Star Trek. And uh, it was such a thrill for me to be with you two here. Uh, I, I've been here before, I've given the tour before, but this is like super special. So let's do it again. Let's please do it again. Okay. <laughs>